remember that how important watching the river when it rains meant to us when we lived down river. We have so many memories from down river. One morning as I'm preparing breakfast here this morning, I think of another time I was preparing breakfast. Doctor, hurry. I'm used to those words back here. And here they were bringing, carrying this man up to the clinic. And I thought, what in the world? A person with a nosebleed, it's an emergency, and now they're carrying him up to the clinic? Well, Larry turned to me and he says, go ahead and finish fixing breakfast, call me when it's ready, and then I'll come on home, because we live right next to the clinic. He says, it won't take long, it's just a nosebleed. So I finished fixing breakfast, and a few minutes later, I called out. He came home and I said, well, how's Garcia? I said, they were carrying him up. He says, yeah, do you know he's been bleeding for three days? I says, I know he's bleed for three days. He says, yeah, he's so weak. I said, well, how is he now? Oh, he'll be fine. No problem. Okay, so we went ahead and ate. Well, first we had our devotions. I started stacking up the dishes. He says, I'm going to go and check on Garcia. So I kept cleaning up the kitchen and put on the water to boil. And we had an old kerosene stove, so it took, oh, close to 45 minutes to an hour to bring a big kettle of water to boil. And I thought, oh, I've got plenty of time. I'm going to go check on Garcia also. Now, I'm not a nurse, but I'm curious. And I've become more curious after living with the Agarunas. I find out that he is the son of the, one of the most prominent witch doctors in the area. And I go walking into the clinic and I open the door and I look and I... <gasps> That's just my reaction because there was Garcia lying on the cot, vomiting, nothing but pure blood. He had a big basin already full and it was running over. And Larry, in a soft voice, as if nothing was happening, said to me in English, don't make a scene, act as if everything is normal, and get out of here and go back home. Well, he didn't have to add that last part. I was going back home. So I went home, and I ran home almost. And I fell on my knees because I thought, if this poor guy has been bleeding for three days, and he's vomiting pure blood like this, and that much, he's dying. And I fell down by my bed and I cried and I prayed and I cried and prayed until I felt victory. And I got up and did my work. And Larry stayed over until about noontime. And when he came over, I said, well, how's Garcia? And he says, he's going to make it. I know he's going to make it. He, there hasn't been any more bleeding since that time that you were over. He's weak. We're going to have to watch him really close. And each day, we could see him getting stronger and stronger. But he was still very, very weak. Still was not walking. He had lost too much blood. He wasn't walking. And uh, it was this was about three days later. And here came the old witch doctor. And he came down. And he says, I'm taking my son home. Larry says, oh, no, you're not. He's too weak. I still have to watch him. He's, I don't want him to leave yet. He needs to be under my care for a few more days. I'm taking him home. You've got to keep him here. I'm taking him home. And this argument went back and forth. Well, the old witch doctor won. We went home. They went up the river. I was so sad. I thought, oh, no, that poor young, he was a, just a young man, I would say probably 20, 21 years of age, and I don't know what's going to happen to him, the father, of his witch doctor, we prayed for him, prayed for 
Garcia, and years passed. Finally, we had started our Bible school. Didn't wasn't praying for Garcia anymore. And each new year, when the new students would come, we would say, now would all the new students please stand, give your name, where you're from. And this young man stood up, he gave his name. Larry leaned over to me and he says, you know who that is, don't you? And I says, no, I don't. He says, that's Garcia, the man with the nosebleed. I said, you're kidding. He had gotten saved. He wanted to come down to the Bible school. He came, he started a church in his village, from that village started another church further in. But as far as I know, the old witch doctor never did become converted. Victory was lost. We were so thrilled. I mean, this was just, uh, I couldn't believe it. But how God had saved him and, and healed him for a definite purpose. No sorrows befall us and Satan oppose. God leads his dear children along. Through grace we can conquer, defeat all our foes. God leads his dear children along. Some through the water. Some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song. In the night season and all the day long. I'm called, called to specific people, to a specific place, and it's not easy to trade that in. You just don't walk out on, on that type of a call. God was always first, you know, with my parents. When we first came in, you could only come as far as Chidiaco. And I don't think it was until maybe after they were married did they feel the direct call to go to the Awaruna tribe. People were very receptive of us. They were an easy people to love. But I know God has given us even more love. Eight bucks. <laughs> I hated to go down there because a little fish would come and nibble on my legs and I couldn't take it. Most of the time there were seven of us in the car. Because we'd have somebody else with us always. It just worked out that way. And every somebody. time we had seven in the car, it always broke down. And something would happen. I had to do a lot of things I never never knew about. <laughs> I was never taught about by force of fix it or don't use it. Our fox threw up in the back seat of the car. Six garments with their heads out the window, windows rolled down. Every time we'd go over a bump and you'd, all, everything would seem to go fly and then settle back down, I felt something crawling on my ankle. And I knew a box had broken and a snake had gotten out and was crawling. And I mean, I came unglued. Well, everybody was, what's the matter? I can hardly hear the snake. There's a snake. I know it is. And look down and it was my sweater wrapped around my ankle. If I saw that picture once, I saw it a hundred times. That uh, they, they, they prayed constantly. When we first started here, we were getting about 150 inches a year of rain. No electricity. All my cooking was done on kerosene stove. We always had people at our windows here at this house. My love is, is for the jungle and for the Aburundas. I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning in heavy labor. Very, very heavy labor. Never regret ever growing up here in the jungles. And all I could say was, pray, Larry. The alligator hunting at night. This baby's going to be born, and I don't have a thing back here. Eating grub worms. <laughs> I'm dancing everywhere. Mom, mom, mom. 
And meanwhile, it's just crawling all over my stomach. And finally, that crazy bat flew into the toilet. We were coming up river, and we could see Mom with Tim in her arms, frantically waving her arms. Are you really positive that God's called you? I'll never forget the day of the war. Canoe went by, came down the river. People were painted up, had their shotguns. They I began to see my personality change. It's 5 o'clock every morning is prayer, prayer. time. 6 o'clock that afternoon, 200 or more Indians came all around the house. The church is eternal. It, it's not going to be chased away. They were all crying. The women were giving the death well. It was horrible. I live probably on a daily basis overwhelmed. Can't do it. I can't. God, I just can't do it. If you can't help them, they're not going to get help. Okay, God, you called me. And I'm here because you called me. So you've got to help me. And he would. We lost all contact with the outside world except my ham radio. Mm -hmm. No newspaper, no magazine, no TV, no no diversion to speak of. So our world became our world became the jungle. We had to call on God. We couldn't talk to anybody else. Here in the jungle you live you don't live but a day in a time. There were a lot of obstacles, superstition, witchcraft. Revenge killings were very, at that time, were very real. She'd fix him crawdads over the fire and fix him roasted bananas. We're seeing each other now, but maybe it'll be our last time to ever see each other again. Those first years, we involved ourselves a lot in the village life. Hold services, hold clinic, and the kids became part of it. We used them in the services. Candy would take up the offering, uh, rest in place, trumpet. Greg even take his drum along. And then they'd water ski in the afternoon and uh, play soccer. And Sunday, bathing suits under the breast clothes to go to church. We're here at the New Horizons Mission Station, Church of the Nazarene. And the river is uh, the Matanon River headwaters of the Amazon and New Horizons is on a high bluff uh, overlooking uh, this river and the valley and there are mountains that are hidden by the clouds there in the background we have crossed those mountains Addie and I uh, we have churches on the other side of them uh, in fact we've even taken work and witness teams across on the other side a couple of them uh, about a seven seven hour jaunt up and over this station uh, New Horizons has been located here for us about 15 years now, 16 years, and it was uh, our second station. felt that we needed to move to a different center, to a place where we'd have both access to the river and to the road that's penetrating uh, on down through the jungle. Uh, this opened up for us as a real miracle. Uh, the Lord just gave us his parcel of land. All the buildings were built by Working Witness. Everything. I, I, 
if uh, if it hadn't been for work and witness, this place wouldn't be here. When we came, there there were no churches on the road. The mestizos or the the mixed blood people were just beginning to come into the area, kind of pioneer-like people, uh, taking uh, homesteads from the government. And as we moved up here to this area, to this station, why we immediately felt the need to reach these people as well. The work has grown just on the road among the mestizos to a number of churches and several hundred people. So the mestizo work is beginning to open up now as well as the Indian work. We prepare the men and women for preaching and teaching. It's a three-year uh, Bible course, and uh, at the same time, they are taking a nursing program. He was bitten yesterday. ¿A qué hora fue mordido, hermanito? A las seis. Seis de la tarde. En la tarde. They live up river about three hours away, so they just got here this morning. We'll get down and take a look, and we'll probably just treat him symptomatically, but... He's having a lot of hemorrhage, I think, through the... They begin to bleed through the gum. See that? She, she's smiling. She's got a beautiful smile. He does, too. Well, the clinic has, across the years, opened the doors for ministry. Uh, Jesus said, the poor you'll have always with you. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as a messenger to my people? Who will go? And I said, Lord, I'll go. Send me. And Jeremiah 1, 5. Before I fastened you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I dedicated you. I designated needed you for a prophet to the nations. He knows us before we're born. Boy, that, that was his son. You know, we're so small. And he then consecrates us. And he calls us. And so many times we say, I can't do it. And that's what I did. I went to Pasadena College with very little knowledge of of uh, evangelical Christianity. And uh, there through numerous incidents, uh, I went there as a very scrawny high school kid. I then went to college and I still kept fighting it. Because, and I'll be truthful, I was scared to death <coughs> that if I said yes to God, I would be an old maid missionary living in a hut someplace with snakes and spiders. And I came across the Bert Goodrich gym, who had been a Mr. America type thing, and I went in and he said right away, he said, we can help you. <laughs> I hated missionary services. Every time we had a missionary come to the church, I hated it because it broke that call right back to me again. And I saw these guys that look in the mirrors and flexing and pumping iron and I thought, well, this this would be good. I'd see if I can develop. So over the over the months and then the next year, I developed physically quite 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 a lot. It probably went to my head a little bit. I, I can't go on like this. So I took my Bible and I knelt down by my bed and I says, Lord, if you really really want me to be a missionary, give me something. Show me a verse in the scriptures, and I let it fall. <laughs> <laughs> I don't advise you to do that. <laughs> then I had an experience there in Pasadena. I was, went with a friend of mine who had problems with his girlfriend. He wanted to talk to me. We went behind the hills and we saw a cable going across the canyon. And I said, let's, let's hand walk that canyon. Romans 10. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I thought, well, that's, that's wonderful, Lord. I, and I called on you. But how should they ask him to save them unless they believe in him? Now it, God was really beginning, my heart began to pound like crazy. And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? Boy, about that time, my heart about jumped out of my body. And then the crowning blow. 
and how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And God says, are you going to let that person go? It was a hot day, and the palms got slippery, and about halfway out, and I was first, of course, and he was behind me. Well, he could tell his palms were getting wet, and mine were too. He turned back, and I wanted to, but it was too late, and uh, struggled with it, and finally just slid off of the wire straight down. He ended up fracturing uh, the lumbar spine, uh, broke both the wrist, smashed both heels, and anyway, in a body cast for a number of months and arm cast. So the Lord was able to get my attention at that time about, about vanity. And I says, okay, God, if you really want me to be a missionary, tuck in. Give me a promise. And I went to the promise box. Out of all those hundreds of promises, I pulled up. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. And it was during that time, and then another incident, that I came down with pericarditis, an in, uh, infection around the heart. And at that time, they didn't really have good, good medication for it. And I had to pray this prayer. If you want me to be a single missionary, I will be a single missionary. Those two incidents, the Lord began to speak to me about my life. and. And then I, I began to feel a, a growing sensation, feeling about helping others. When we started dating, he didn't know anything about my call. And I didn't know anything about his battles that he was going through. One night we were talking and he says, I don't know how you're going to take this. But I feel God calling me to the mission field. <laughs> it was before we graduated, before Eddie and I got married, that I felt a definite call that I have to be a missionary. That's, I don't know where, but that will be it. God was just directing our, we were just open to the Lord, whatever he wants. And then we had a missionary come and speak. And he showed the jungles. And he showed all the Indians. And he showed the mission, present missionary who did not know anything about medicine, mm -hmm. dispensing medicine from his living room. And he says, what we need here is a doctor. And he spoke that night about having had gone into the jungle with another missionary and about a tribe of people that live very, uh, on the very fringe of society who had no medical facility, no treatment. People who suffered from a lot of different diseases and they desperately needed some type of medical help. And as I listened to him that night, knowing that we'd been called. And Larry is not an emotional person. He, it's very hard for him to cry. That night he cried like a baby in the service. So I talked to him after the service and he told me, uh, that he'd been back at headquarters a couple weeks ago and that they had a couple in California they were thinking about sending there. And that week then we got a letter. Maybe it was the next week. We got a letter from Kansas City. Would you be interested in a rural assignment? <laughs> <laughs> so it confirmed our faith in the process, confirmed our faith in the church, uh, confirmed our faith in the call because my call came directly from the Lord. But I still was fighting it. Couldn't we go someplace else? All week long I was just nervous. And I said, Lord, what is it? What is it? But yet I didn't want him to tell me. I was fighting. And on that Saturday night, I opened my son to school us. And it says, Roger and Mr. in the journals. The fact that I'm called called to specific people, to a specific place, and it's not easy to trade that in. Rusty was five, Greg was three, and Kenny was one. Not one and a half. And I said, Lord, take them to the jungles. What will I feed them? How will I get food? I can't do it. And I fought, and I knelt down by my bed, I says, okay, Lord, here's Rusty. 
He's yours. Whatever happens, he's in your hands. I have to take my hands off of it. Lord, here's Greg. He's in your hands. I'm taking my hands off of it. Here's Candy, Lord. She's in your hands. And I'm taking my hands off. They're yours, Lord. I don't know how we're going to make it. The presence of Jesus came so close. And I just said, Lord, thank you. We're in your hands. We will go. And when the going has gotten a little tough, why, we've always relied back on the call. When we first came back in 1965, uh, we found one Sunday school functioning in the village of Yamiyakat. And the beautiful thing about these stories is there's a verse that says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his power never diminishes, it's eternal. The work has grown from one Sunday school to over 140 churches. En la cruz, en la cruz, do premido a ver la luz. En las manchas de mi alma yo la ve. Fue allí por fe tu vida en Jesús y siempre feliz con él seré. The Amazon is so vast so incredibly large, so expansive and hard to get to many of the areas that it just, it will take a lot of people to reach many of these remote areas. So we're, our challenge is to, for some more pioneers to come along. We have students that have graduated from our Bible school. We've never been to their villages. They're so isolated that, that from where we are here now, it would take you three, four, to five days to get to their place from here. We're the only Nazarene missionaries on the river here, between here and the, uh, the Atlantic, mm -hmm. 3,000 miles from here. I think the greatest days are ahead for missions in our church. I really do believe that. Uh, I think this is the day of the layman. I'm mm -hmm. a layman. Well, I think our church is moving in, in a wonderful direction, oh, in allowing the layman to express himself and to become part of ministry. Our goal is the Amazon for Christ. It'll probably not be realized in our lifetime. But if we could challenge young people and others, the Amazon is big. It needs some pioneers. It needs some people that are willing to go out to some of these forgotten rivers and, and, and spread the word. Uh, we just can't move enough, fast enough, in the time we have left to make much of a dent, but we've got a good start. So the Amazon is wide open. It's a huge, huge area, and the people desperately need the gospel. Some through the water.